Check, check, check. WRFUOP here, Banner 104.5 FM. I want to thank everyone for bearing through all the madness and craziness. Still got a lot of technical hurdles we're trying to overcome in order to get this going smooth, video and audio. We appreciate everyone who's tuning in at the moment. I want to say Benny Shonis to my grandmother, my mother, my godmother back in New York and Puerto Rico. Some I love out to my family and friends. Whether you're in arms reach away or a digital mile, technical Facebook message away, we appreciate you supporting. The original track you just heard a second ago was actually provided to me by DJ Hush from Hush Creations back in Massachusetts, holding it down for the whole MA over there. I want to thank him and some family out there. He sent me that track maybe a half hour, hour before the show. Definitely grateful to him for that. We're going to have a great show today, as always. This is the first time, first time ever we're video streaming. It's actually have a great guest today. Fabiana Rodriguez is in the house right now. <laughs> There's actually some people in the audience, man, who are going to slowly but surely going through all this technical madness. People will not believe what's going on. Thank you to Sonic Asylum, which just checked off for the evening, has, does their show from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. I want to thank the early show, which does their show from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Also going on tomorrow, an event that's being coordinated by various student organizations at Latcher Hall from 7 from 12.30 rather, p.m. to 2.30 p.m. will be taking place at the YMCA, the University YMCA. can come on and catch Faviana. That'll be the uh, PG-13 version of what we do to here. <laughs> Seriously, though. Got a lot of issues I want to talk about. I want to dedicate this show. I got to dedicate this show, man. I always, I've been starting to dedicate shows to different people. I want to de dedicate it to all the Latinos out there, all the African American women, all the Asian women, in particular the Indian and Pakistani women of pigment. Hold on, folks, before you. <laughs> I want to dedicate to these ladies, all the ladies that go to the tanning salon and already have a pigment. It actually irks me a lot, man. I was, I parked my car. Tanning salons are like churches in this area. I don't know what's going on with this. Like one every other block within the campus town area. I parked my car to go get some food from this campus town uh, business. And I parked my car. It's like classic tan or tannerific or whatever the hell it's called. One of these million ones we have here. And I see, of course, there's a white girl that works at the counter, of course. And then there's this other white girl waiting for a tan. And then there's other Indian, you know, Pakistani or some girl from Asia, whatever. She's saying that this girl was tan skinned. She was already, she was darker than me and a couple of people in this room. And I'm like, she's just sitting there like trying to look straight forward. Like, and I'm not what everyone's thinking in their mind. Like, what's wrong with this girl? Why is she coming to get a tan? And I'm standing there parking my car, looking at her ogling as well. Like, what's going on here? That's, that's the thing about this town. I, I get caught in these situations. Things come into my mind in this town unlike any other place I've ever been. For example, this I don't know if this has ever happened to you. You park your car in, in campus town, or I'm at the light, and I see these two people in a the, in the wheelchair. I'm like, oh my God, these two guys are such a-holes. And that's the first thought that comes to my mind. I know I was like, what were you saying? Like, then I, you have to understand. I guess there had just been a game that had just you know finished, and these two guys are going across the street, you know, across the street, whatever. They both had chief mascot shirts on, I'm like, oh my god, like these guys, and then I'm like, hold on a second, they see me ogling at them, looking like them in such a negative fashion, I wonder if they think that I'm ogling at them because they're in wheelchairs, I'm like, oh, I hope they know that it's just because they're a-holes because they had the chief shirt on and not because they're in wheelchairs, because then that make me, well, that doesn't make me feel bad anyway, I'm just saying, it's kind of, it's not what I meant to do. So we're going to talk about a lot of issues, folks, I'm going to give, you guys ever read those books when you were younger, those adventure books where you could choose an ending? Choose an ending. I, I, I can either make a confession or I can give you like a top 10 list of things that I would not do at UIUC. I, I can make a confession for you here live on the spot or 10 things. Which would the confession? <laughs> Damn, she said that kind of quick. <laughs> okay, what should I say? What should I say? All right, a confession I can make. So this is what happened, right? I used to live in an area in the South Bronx by Stratford Avenue, by the sixth train, Soundview Morrison live a block and a half off of there, right? It's kind of crazy. As I, the, I lived on the fourth floor, one of my best friends lived on the ground level, and I felt so bad about this. Well, not for what I'm about. <laughs> he, lived on a, he lived on the ground floor, and his family, they moved a lot, of, a lot of what we say weight, is what we call that, you know what I'm saying? There wasn't a, they were like, you know, overweight, moving back and forth. They moved a lot of stuff, man, copious amounts. But regardless, that was my best friend. I would go to his house all the time. We, you know, spend time together and whatnot. And because of what they were doing, they were always outside. They were always outside in the evenings at nighttime. So one time I decided myself, just for fun, man, I, I, I know this is wrong, I shouldn't have done this, this is part of my confession, I have to confess. I sort of used to throw pennies out the window <laughs> while they were outside, you know, basically corner standing. I would throw them out there and you know, throw pennies out the window and they would fall on, and that's not the confession, that's not the confession yet. But I would throw pennies and a little bit of hot water on them while they were outside 
And but of course they, they were outside when they were not supposed to be doing what they were doing, and they would and they would yell from the bottom from the ground level. Mind you, they live on the ground level. If you live in the hood, you never want to live on the ground level. The ground level there's always barred. Just bad things happen. But actually they were part of the bad things. But that was still my best friends, family, whatever. So I'm throwing hot water out the window on them at nighttime. I would stick my hands out and put them back in, so they couldn't tell where it came from. But they knew everyone who lived in every floor. <laughs> and of course I knew them because I would go to their house all the time, you know. And I knew their son and I would play with them every single day, you know, whether it was basketball, football. And so after a while, they would be like, oh, what the, you know, what are you doing? What the hell? So then one day, you know, my friend's mother, you know, she comes, she catches me and my mother walking from the store and she stops my mom and she goes, hey, you know, I don't mean any disrespect. I want to cause any trouble. I want to let you know, I think your son <laughs> is throwing pennies and hot water out of the window at us. <laughs> you know, I just want to let you know, I just, we, we're cool and everything. And I'm standing there and then my mom turns to me and she turns to me and she goes, you know, is that true? Did you do that? And I lied, folks, I lied to her, and I said, no, Ma, I didn't do that, I didn't do that. But I did it, man, and I did it repeatedly, <laughs> and many, many times. I don't really feel bad about that, man, like I said, man, I, that was my one of my best friends, and his, his mom, and his family, and whatnot, his brothers, and whatnot. But it's, you know, it was water under the bridge. Anyhow, that was my that was my story, my confession. I felt really bad that it ate me up until this day. Not about, like I said, I lied to my mom. That just made me feel real bad. So that was my confession, man. We have a great guest for you tonight. Fabiano Rodriguez is going to be on with us, have a little conversation about Art and Resistance, an event that's going to be taking place tomorrow at Latcher Hall from 12.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. at the University YMCA. Along with that, we had DJ Hush Creations that provided me with a beat you were just listening to. Next coming up, I'm going to play two tracks and we'll come back and have a little conversation, a little dialogue, spit a little di diatribe, you know, different artists converge with me. Next week we have, the shows are just going to get better and better, amazing artists are going to come here, make me look better, I'm like, I'm so grateful to them. Next Friday we have Prelude d'Amour, we're going to have three or four acts going to come on live, you know, G-Swiss, Kim K, Andy Marillion is going to be here, No Common Acapella, Organic Flow, along with DJ Merce is going to bless us, man. Catch us, catch us, man. We're coming with you with different vibes, different flows. Hopefully you're enjoying us. If you're catching us on the internet, live, whatever it may be, keep staying tuned with us. It's the show. But what we can say along with that is a lot of different events taking place within the community. Hope you take, it, take advantage of all this free art that we're trying to give out to you. It's currently line number, <laughs> line number two. Line number two and number one are the ones for the microphones. Well, let's do a quick introduction. Let's do a quick clockwise introduction. Tell them who you are, where you're coming from. Quick mic check. Hi, everybody. I'm Fabiana Rodriguez. I'm from Oakland, California. Artist, um, activist, agitator, writer, oh my gosh. and a uh, woman of color. I'm very proud to be a woman of color. First generation. My parents immigrated here. So, from where? Uh, from Peru. Uh, and I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm really honored to have, I just turned 30. So oh, I'm my really gosh. Uh, woo! Yeah. Milestone, milestone. <laughs> I, 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 I turned 30, actually, like, in September. Oh, uh, I know how Latinas excited. are. They celebrate it all year. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm excited, and I'm really excited to be here because, you know, I, I met um, Joe and, and Laura, and I met a lot of people even when I was doing activism in high school. And it's amazing how people through their careers, they kind of stay in touch. And our movement, I mean, there's no borders in reality. I, I People that I met long ago are now organizing in, um, in Mexico or in Europe or all over the United States. And so in a way, our network grows. And mm -hmm. so I'm really happy to be here because I get to see a lot of people that I haven't seen in years. So. It's kind of surprising. Do you, you have a lot of, I think, listeners or, or viewers going on right now from Germany, I think. Is that, is well, I hope so. I hope my friend uh, Martin is tuning in from Germany, my <laughs> friend Reed in Oakland, uh, my friend Patricia in Oakland, too. You know, again, technology enables us to be very connected, you yeah. know, and so um, thank you. Yeah, and big ups to uh, my cousin Magnetic as well, myspace.com forward slash it's magnetic, it's magnetic. Another artist coming out there along with DJ Hustle Creations. Let me ask you, what exactly is it that you do? Because I think it's very ambiguous from, you know, printmaker, you know, I mean, there's, people don't understand what they're going to get tomorrow when they see you. What are you going to be doing for the two hours that you're there with them? Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit first about what I do, because what I, I, I do many different things. Uh, I, I'm an artist, first and foremost, and I do a lot of works on paper, and I work uh, as a printmaker because... Uh, it's through working on paper that I'm able to have multiples and so you know when what does that mean multiples so like if a person does out, a painting you just have usually one of that painting I see I see I see and, and so the history of printmaking is that it's always been a, a political tool to organize because you could have many copies of the same poster I see and so the artwork becomes something that's not as elitist it's become something that's really accessible and so uh, I'm, a, I'm a printmaker and I'm also a technologist 
I, I learned uh, my my Chicano friends in college actually taught me how to code HTML right in the early, in nineties when the internet when it was, was first coming first out. Coming out, I remember being HTML. More, yeah, and and uh, and so I'm I'm really committed to technology, and so I, I like to explore things like video. Uh, I work in radio also, doing covering kind of stories in arts and culture. Uh, and recently, I published a book with Josh McPhee called Reproduce and Revolt. And that book is a collection of um, 600 graphics from 200 artists in 12 countries, and it's bilingual. And so that you know, did you that, know the people that you got the pictures from, or, or? actually I, I didn't? But again, you know, and, and even my co-editor was in New York, and I was in the Bay. So we did oh. a three-year-long project practically over email. I mean, we put out a call to artists, and artists would email in their graphics. And after three years, we had, you know, a little under a thousand graphics to do a book. Wow. So, um, yeah, I, I really, I, I love technology, I love art, and I'm always trying to find ways to meld those together. So you've mentioned some of the actual physical things you do. What about actually the, what's the purpose of it? What's the message you try to, you know, get across to people? Well, I think, like, we are in a big time of crisis. I think we're in a time when corporations are kind of doing whatever they want. Everything from privatizing water to privatizing prisons. You have education system consistently failing young men of color. And young men of color are going to prisons in record rates. At the same time, 32% of blacks are more likely to spend time yeah. in local and or federal prison. 17% of Hispanics are likely to spend time throughout right. their lifetime in local, state, federal prisons. And that growing population is now also immigrants because now it's it's a it's it's more and more you know the jails realize well we can make money off filling these beds so let's start filling them with immigrants. And so I think also media we're at a time when media is extremely monopolized and it's really no you're not part of the, the big bad monopoly but also that word, you know, the media. Media is so like a you know ambiguous. <laughs> the well, media. I would say corporate media, okay. corporate media like Disney, uh, Fox, MSN, all the people who who <laughs> CNN, Clear Channel, you know, people who consistently don't give us the truth. And I mean, how many of you have seen the war on TV? You don't see the war because Dick Cheney said you can't show war and you can't show dead bodies. So you see, we're we're at a time when media is completely monopolized. And so you think Dick Cheney said that and made that rule? No, they, you think they, they did the they they made the executive order to do that to not allow media's to show the actual war. Because I mean, sometimes you, I guess you don't see the bodies, but you do see footage of them on the ground and whatnot. So I don't rarely, rarely, and that's because in Vietnam, when they started showing it, people that's became when aware they, of it every day. That's when the but do you think that's depressing? People, they don't want to put that on. I mean, as, if it's not sens if it's depressing and not sensational, it's not likely to make the news. You know what I'm saying? Like well, somebody gets shot and like they or it kills three people at one day. You know, but. Then, then it's sensational. They can, you know, fan. Well, there's also like really that. big money to be made in war. I mean, who is getting hired? Halliburton and all these companies that the Republicans were working for, and especially Bush and all his entourage. And so, of course, they're going to uh, want to pass restrictive media laws because it's better for all of us to kind of be in this uh, bubble than for us to understand how much our tax dollars were actually funding the war. And now you see a whole image of, of economic collapse because for so long I think people were just not aware. So when, you, when you're going to produce your artwork tomorrow, are you going to get this all across to them tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, that's, that's one why picture. I make It's going to be art. one picture. That's why I make art is because uh, I, this is the situation that we live in. And as an artist, that's the one way that, um, that I could have a voice for many, for, for many different communities that, that I try to represent, right? And, and I think through art or even what you're doing, like through media, through music. I don't know what I do, girl. I don't even know what I do. <laughs> I just, well, I <laughs> what do I do? Because always do I not really what I do. Well, you're, you're <laughs> making media and you're making, you know, you're you're projecting your voice and that can be done through music. I do it through art. I like that. I projecting my voice. I like that. Spin that. My, I like that. You know, and you do so it projectile. in any way you can. And I <laughs> same same thing with me. For me, I do it any way I can as to kind of um, be a, a voice of, of dissent. And I feel like I'm a I'm a product of history. I mean, they've been doing this for for history, history, you know. <laughs> for part of history, you're right. There you go. So in terms of the, the media you make, you've been making it all across the world, Bay Area only, DC. Where I mean, what do you, where well, have I you just, been? Where I do you go? I was just at DC at the Green Jobs Conference. Green and Jobs. Conference? Green Jobs, and, and for those of you who want to learn more, you can go to greenforall.org. But really, what Green Jobs is about is that you know, for years, the environmental movement and the kind of anti-racism movement they were very separated. So we would be like, oh, you know, who cares about the polar bears if people are getting killed in East Oakland? And so that was the, well, that was our, that's the way people, you know, right. would be like, whatever. 
But at the same I'm time, I'm saying, what's the big deal? Polar bears are getting good. Well, we, I think. <laughs> explain we're, it to me. Explain we're it. Explain it. We're the most affected in terms of um, uh, climate change because uh, environmental racism. Because usually the incinerators are put in our communities. You know, our youth, our children are facing the highest rates of asthma. Wait, you didn't have an incinerator where you lived? I didn't, uh, really? Really? Is that only put in poor areas? Yeah. Uh. So, and and then even also, um, you know, all workers are being exposed to all kinds of toxic stuff. Very true. Our well. people, of course. And so we have to be the ones fighting for all the, all these, you know, all these laws and all these kind of policies that will make the earth a better place really affect us most of all, I think, at the end of the day. So what this conference was about was saying, you know, um, we need to really be giving people green jobs because right now, number one, people need jobs, but they also need jobs that are going to be sustainable to the planet. You know, like, so we need to be putting in solar panels, you know, finding wind power. We need to be finding ways to have community gardens and stuff because that's what's going to solve um, a lot of the bigger issues we're facing. So you went out there for the conference or you lived there? No, 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 I went out to D.C. for the conference and okay. uh, I'm, I am I travel a lot. I was recently in, in December, I was in, in Rome, kicking it with What? The with the Pope? <laughs> <laughs> Were you with? No, the Pope. I didn't go see the Pope. Uh, what, what about no the one way. that denied the Holocaust, the other bishop? Did you see his? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, so I went there actually to go collaborate with some other political artists and, you know, again, we are... Uh, activists are all over the world. Everywhere there, people are trying to change stuff. And when I was in Rome, and then I went to Germany, um, that's when they had shot this kid in Greece. I don't know if you guys remember that. They were yes, rioting for almost seven... The, the, police, the police shot him, right? Was yeah, the, the police yeah. shot him. And he was, I think, 14, 13 or 14. And there was a huge... You know, there was riots for days. I think it was at least longer than a week. Um, and so I was it, was... it was inspiring, actually, to see that. Because you said, wow, like this... Like, they, they don't play. I mean, they are really taking back their streets. They're really fighting really? for the brutality. <laughs> and it's, you know, and this Did the guy who, who did this shooting, did he ever get caught or did he get uh, I think he got um, immediately suspended. Very different, of course, than what happens here in the United States. Immediately I mean, suspended. Without pay or with pay? Uh, I pay think he on. got suspended without pay. And there was, a, there was also... I have to actually... I, would, I, I don't know the entire story, but people fought and they pressured the government to be able to... You know, find solutions fast. See, I mean, we had. And speaking of shootings, ironically enough, there was one. Obviously, the one in the Bay Area, but one I didn't want to mention, which probably won't make much news, is one Billy Joe Johnson Jr. in Mississippi was recently yeah, shot on December right. 17th or 18th. Basically, as he was going home from visiting his girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, white. white girl. This is a black guy, football star. Um, in essence, was coming home from you know visiting his ex-girlfriend, who had to think. Supposedly, what's being reported is that they had broken up, and you know, I guess he was visiting her because, sort of on you know strenuous terms, because the father sort of forbid it, I believe, very birth of a nation esque, and so the um, the kid is coming home, and apparently the officer stopped, pulls him over for routine traffic stops, and suddenly the guy shoot the kid shoots himself with a shotgun, yeah, and commits suicide. But they're that's the end of the saying, story. That's all we know. <laughs> that's what we know. Billy Joe Johnson Jr. apparently. Superstar athlete who was going to be receiving an award on Monday, who had just had a conversation with his coach about what to wear when it was, decides to shoot himself, put the gun, the shotgun to his head. For those of you that don't know, a right-handed person with a shotgun is very difficult to pull the trigger. Apparently, is what they're reporting, so it's very, very difficult to do. And that's that's it. You know, they're hopefully going to pressure him to do uh, an investigation and probe the Mississippi Police, Mississippi Bureau of Investigation. I yeah, and you could actually, if you want to put in uh, your complaint and really push for a thorough investigation, you can go to colorofchange.org and really, uh, you know, petition so that you see justice. Because, again, this is Mississippi. I mean, this is the South. And they're racist you know? in Mississippi. I don't care what nobody say. But I don't, I'll put it on black. Hey, you from Mississippi, you didn't like what I said? Prove me wrong. That's so all you can say. Prove me wrong. I've been in a lot of places. A lot of people say whatever they want. I haven't been to Mississippi. I don't understand what I'm going to say that, but, but they're racist. No. <laughs> but, no, I know anything south of Chicago is the south, but Mississippi is a world unto itself. There's a lot of issues with the fish workers, I believe. The women's fish workers that try to unionize over there, and they had a lot of issues. You know, people with, like, modern day, you know, civil rights abuses go down there all the time, all the time. So I'm not, I feel very comfortable in stating that, not feeling like I can, I can prove that on with it with evidence. But... Billy Joe Johnson is one situation. Hopefully that gets some media attention. But also Oscar Grant. Right. You're from the Bay Area. Were you around when that happened? Well, you know, the Fruitvale is two blocks. I live the in the Fruitvale. Fruitvale. The Fruitvale Bart Station, which is where this happened, is two blocks from my house. And on New Year's Day, I remember my neighbor said, oh, did you hear they shot somebody? And I said, it just, you know, it, I didn't really think about it. But 
a few days later, the video footage had come out. And so, um, of course, you know, we're, we're YouTube out. YouTube is a mother, man. Is that yeah, no, but it also shows how everybody now can make their own media. You understand? Like, it really changed the way, the, uh, the power. It, it really shifted power in terms of, of who was telling the, the, the right story or whose story was getting picked up. I think was really good. And so um, there was a lot of organizing. There still is a lot of organizing. Uh, the group that I'm a part of, the Tayer Tupac Amaru, which is... Uh, Do you have a website? Yep, tayertupacamaru.org. That, for <laughs> that is... Uh, <laughs> I was like, what the hell? Did <laughs> Tayer, that's T-A-L-L. Yeah, oh, damn, I'm never going to find this group. <laughs> that's uh, T-A-L-L-E-R, Tupac, T-U-P-A-C, Amaru, A-M-A-R-U.com. Again, named after... Taller Tupac Shakur? <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, Tupac, Tupac Shakur was named after Amaru. Tupac Amaru. Amaru, okay. The Peruvian, uh, who, the, Peru, the, the, the indigenous totally, Peruvian uneducated. fighter who finally faced the, the Spaniards. And they actually, they cut him up into pieces and they had tied him up into, they, they tied each of, his, each of his limbs to horses in an effort to kill Just him. Just half. And they, they, the horses ran in, in four different directions and they couldn't kill him. So they had to slice them up and, and that's, you know, the... You can imagine, well, everyone knows the history of the Spaniards and, and, and kind of how the brutality that took place here. On this People forget the day. Spanish Inquisition never happened, man. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> We're all lovers, right? Uh, another, uh, going back to the issue of the Oscar mm-hmm. Grant situation. And what was the reaction like in terms of? I mean, there were obviously there was rioting over there. Were you a part of that? Well, see, Did you see any of it? Yeah. Not the rioting. I mean, like the. <laughs> yeah. The, the, were you throwing bricks into the? No. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Why well, uh, that day? That day there was a, a really uh, great protest organized in front of bar, and there was a lot of activists of color who came out. It was just great to see. And and, and I went to that. And after, of course, I, I followed the crowd, being the the curious person that I am and uh, you know it was interesting because when you when you actually saw the crowd it didn't look uh, as chaotic as what TV showed you it actually looked what was excessive was the amount of police that were there and the amount of riot gear but for the most part I mean they had the I mean protesters. I guess they did expect a large number of black people to show up I well, guess what, it's reasonable. What, what was what happened? Here's what happened. Because when I was there, <laughs> when I was there, that's an automatic police response, man. That's automatic. Right. You, gotta, you gotta know that. One. Well, the they when I was there, there was maybe 25 people. The police had everyone surrounded. But on news, they would just cut in on the same shot. They would cut into the police with their big, you know, rifles and their dogs, and it you could almost see how they were building this up. And within one hour, there was 200 people out there again. And so what what I think happened is that the news just totally sensationalized it to the point that they made they people a situation. come out. They created yeah, a situation. They, and, and I know people were mad, but at the same time, they were just, I mean, they were just showing this like it was, uh, uh, like the military had taken over a city or something, and the way they were They were making it seem like it was out of control over there in Oakland. Yeah, and, and, was and it out of control, though? Like, being in the street, if you would have been on the street? I, don't, I, I mean, I think that, I want us to say that pr- property destruction, I don't consider property destruction violence. Mm. And that's a big kind of point, is that people say, well, you were being uh, violent, when in reality what was getting destroyed was property. Now, I, I, as, a, you know, as a woman of color, I have mixed feelings sometimes around um, you know, what, when, when, what people would call rioting or something, because I think that men of color are constantly racially profiled. And so it's a really different thing for like a, a, a white anarchist to riot than it is for like a, a man of color to, to be breaking something, you know? Uh, it's there's very different kind of set of he's not an anarchist he's just out of control <laughs> and, and he's lost thing, control of himself <laughs> and the other thing is that the, you know the reality I grew up in Oakland California and Oakland is the fourth most dangerous city in the country and murder I, it is like five times the, 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 the nation's capital poverty five times like the nation's you know the nation's average rather I should say and, and so <clears throat> I've seen what it means to have that rage when you're a young man of color and you've been so uh, disenfranchised that your rage turns into something that you you put on your own people and I've seen you know how young men of color especially Latino men kill each other and so for me when people exercise that that kind of rage it we have to find another way to deal with that because that's something we always are using on each other and okay maybe sometimes it gets used on property but it's we we have to find another way to channel how it is that our our, our young men or even our young women are feeling you know what I mean? And, and that's sometimes, I think, that's a bigger question. And so when people are saying, yeah, you know, let's, let's you know, mess shit up and let's, you know, it's, 
I don't know. I think that in the long term, I think we have to have a, a bigger vision than that. I definitely think when it comes to the anger, man, there's a lot, a lot of ways to get that energy out. Even if you do want to be constructive, you know, you can't really necessarily do it through education because the avenues right. are always being limited, you know, what you can and can't do. And it's quite unfortunate in that regard. So you're going to be there tomorrow mm -hmm. doing all this print work and giving a two-hour lecture for the folks. And you're an artist in residence where right now? Uh, I'm going to be an artist in residence at Allen Hall, and that starts... Um, on Sunday, I have tomorrow is the lecture at Latzer, and then on Sunday I have another uh, lecture at seven at Allen Hall, and I'm going to be there for a whole week, working, you know, giving workshops, talking about technology, uh, talking about women artists. <laughs> <laughs> I was because I, I thought at first you were just coming for the weekend. I was like, oh, you coming for the weekend? And I was like, and then no, I realized there's a whole week long I'll, series of events. Right, I'll be here till February 16th, and I really want to, you know reach out to people and say, I, I want to definitely get involved in what's what's happening here locally because I think we need, lo locally and nationally, we need to really organize as artists and, and, and communicators. So do you find it's difficult to get people to, like I guess, use that medium to sort of express themselves? Are people reluctant? Are they very, you know, when you Which present Which particular them? medium? I mean, an art in general. Oh. I mean, we say, I want you yeah. to create X, Y, Z, you know, and I'm gonna, we're going to try to be resistant, like, uh, I don't know about this one. Well, I think that... Um, I think that right now there's very few people of color who are doing art uh, that really has kind of a direct, radical social message. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, I think also you have kind of uh, this whole thing where what has been historically called as Chicano art is, is consistently getting co-opted and you have th shows where you know you have major corporate sponsors like Target so you can't you know what I mean you, it's, it becomes Pfizer difficult. you know it Disney becomes yeah. a little difficult We're keeping it's hard to keep it real without you know right. you know keep it real corporate <laughs> <laughs> yeah <Cha -ching>! so, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, I'm really happy that I, I belong to a, a great the Taller Tupac Amaru I work with two other really dope uh, Chicano artists and, and we really you know we, we try to put out as much as we can and nationally I'm part of a group called Just Seeds you can visit justseeds.org and we're a national kind of collective of uh, radical political artists and uh, that you know we were, were were white brown black every actually no we, we we need we need to reach out to more black artists that's, <laughs> that's on the real we need more dirt, ra we need more radical black visual artists kind of uh, collaborating with us Folks out there, does anyone have a question out there? I know some probably some probing mods. They want to ask a question. Feel free to give them an opportunity. You want to present a question? Or you can present a question on the chat. You on the chat, folks out there online, it's hard. For, <laughs> it's kind of hard for me to go over there to the screen. If someone has a question out there, they want to ask Favi. See if anyone says it's best if you type into it. I don't know if that thing is even actually active, man. It's kind of hard. But going on with you, you're going to be here tomorrow. Going to be doing the right. print work. What is it? Where else have you visited over the past few months? Uh, let's see. So Ooh. you went to Rome. Anywhere else in yeah, Europe? Yeah, I was in Rome. I was in Cologne in, in Germany. Um, be before that, a few, I think like maybe seven months ago, I, I had visited Brussels, uh, London, and of course Mexico City. Mexico City, the kind of I consider it the capital of, of Latin America, and, and what's, <laughs> what's happening in Mexico City is, is super dope. Uh, and then of course throughout the U.S., you know, New York. Um, Big up the Bronx. Uh, uh, L.A. Of Every course, I, 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 L.A. I, I visit a lot, and I'm gonna be heading in March to uh, Vancouver. So I'm excited about Wait, that. Not for Carabana, right? No, that's in Montreal. Mo Montreal. What are you doing in Ca Vancouver? In, in Vancouver, I'm uh, gonna be collaborating with uh, uh, the Sisterhood Festival. The Sisterhood, uh, <laughs> the sisterhood <laughs> Festival, and uh, you you can check them out. Actually, I have all these links on, on my website and on my Tell blog. Tell me your website. Uh, my website is faviana.com, and that's spelled F as in Frank, A, B as in Victor, I, A, N, N, A. Com. I'm going to be also collaborating with a group called Fearless City Mobile. And let me tell you how dope these guys are. Okay, these Not the cell phone, mo mobile, mobile yeah, to mobile. No, mobile what they're doing is that they're using mobile technology to really show the injustices happening in Vancouver. Because, again, Vancouver is a city where the Olympics are coming. Yeah. And what happens when the Olympics come? Got to move the poor people out. Got to move the poor people out. And in this case, who are they moving out? They're moving out. Um, what, what is known in Canada as First Nation people, which we know as the indigenous people, you know, Native First Americans. First Nations people? In Canada, Some slang right there, you just learned something. First Nations <laughs> people. So uh, that's the majority of people. Also, I'm going to be working in an in a area that has the highest rate of overdoses 
It has the highest prostitution rate, the highest rate of people getting evicted. So it's definitely an area that's getting affected by this whole, you know, shift to push out the poor. A lot of people who, who the mental health system has just kind of booted them out. And uh, we're going to be doing a project where we're going to be collaborating with VJs and, and mobile phones and kind of all kinds of artists to do, uh, we're going to be showcasing stuff and it's going to be streaming in uh, Vancouver and in Montreal. And so Montreal artists are going to be submitting content too. At the same time live? Right. Yeah. Damn, I love technology, man. I love yeah, technology. Awesome. Folks out there that don't know, plan shrinkage by the government is something that's very common right. in terms of moving people out. It happened in the Bronx during the 1970s in order to make way, or 1960s, I should say, 1970s, to make way for the Cross Bronx Expressway. Something that happens quite often, unfortunately. Um, I have, she was just reading the book. In the South Bronx of America, catalog, catalog some of that. Big up to DJ Nalat's son. What's going on? <laughs> you got a question yeah. in the background? Hey, what a question, you Thank you. <laughs> So, yeah. so oh, to, re cool. to repeat the question, he said, what was it like interacting? What was the reaction to dealing with Chicano, Chicano artists over there in Germany? There are artists over there, Chicano, Chicano artists? Yeah, well, actually, you know, I, it's, it's interesting, but Germany is really open to uh, working with Chicano, Latino artists. And, and I know so many DJs, musicians, hip-hop bands, even writers that are going to cities like Berlin, um, uh, Munich, and are really... Berlin is, Berlin is the... Sh Yes, it's rad. I I'm like trying to go there. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's really great, but also I, I think you know um, we I, I think just general people all over the world uh, consume culture much more than people do in the United States. You know, what I mean, there's more of an emphasis to understand who it is that you're in the world with. You know, and even when I've gone to Japan, people are so interested to hear what it is that we're doing as Latinos in the United States, as Chicanos, as people of color, as artists. And they're very kind of committed to see that side of of, of the America, you know, the, the American face. Because what they're used to seeing is a face of somebody who's white. And they're not necessarily used to seeing us talk about our history, talk about how it is that we're trying to change the whole country. So uh, I, I always get excited about going to Europe because when I go to Europe, I hook up with all kinds of activists there who are also fighting, you know, their, their, in, in their respective countries and really see an alliance with what we're doing. It's also now, I mean, I mean, we, I, I identify as a Chicana because I grew up, you know, in a Chicano community and I, politically, that's how I identify. And, um, I didn't see that box on the voter ballot though. I didn't see <laughs> <laughs> Not yet at least. <laughs> and, and you know what's, what's crazy is like now, I mean, now we're facing globalization. I mean, this is no longer something that we can just contain in our community. This, What's happening around the world, we're all interconnected. And you saw that with the financial meltdown. You know, you see that now you have corporations who, even though are based here, are, are have their factories everywhere in the world, which in turn causes world displacement because then you have a huge wave of immigrants who get displaced, have to come here. And I think that all activists all over the world and artists are, are starting to understand that. So we're always around making international ties, even with what's happening in, in Palestine, you know? <laughs> so we, I feel like our fight has to be an international fight because the U.S. is responsible for some of the most crooked policies in the world. And That's we definitely have to, you know, true. And we have to be, we ha I, I think that as people coming from the belly of the beast, we have to be very proactive around um, uh, expressing our solidarity with what they're doing and also being active around changing what's happening in this country. Think globally, act locally, right? One of the things, though, in terms of that, one of the things that really concerned me, I went to Germany and I saw some folks listening to hip hop. And that's one of the problems of us being so interconnected that I feel sometimes people consume our art and re spit it back at us like an Im imitation, you know, which is always, a, you know, flattery and whatnot. But I think this had lost something in its essence. They were just going through the motions and like they were going through the same problems, but the, their connection to that art wasn't necessarily there. And that's something that actually really concerns me about hip hop. I go to other places and you see, you know, folks in Asia, whether they're Chinese, Japanese, Taiwanese, they got all the latest styles doing the break dancing, the graffiti, and I'm like, wow, these these guys, they know all the words, they don't even know what the hell they say. <laughs> they know all the words to all these songs. I'm like, what the hell's going on? They're more aware of hip hop culture than I am. Like yeah. I grew well, up in the South Bronx. <laughs> but see, no, but they're more aware of the hip hop culture we export. Which is still also around you big be, money. But yeah, and I, that's, I, I, I can see that, but a lot of them have 
access because of technology right, yeah. to yeah, the history and to like they're deep into the game oh I know Curtis Blow babe, what? I'm like yo my problem is that was a medium and an art that was created to help free us which it didn't do it definitely didn't do hip hop helped to enslave us further because it became so <laughs> corporate so fat we really hip hop for the record of folks out there that don't know I'll let you in the secret we took over the world. <laughs> you go anywhere, they're selling Big Macs to Euromeister championships, you know. There, there's hip-hop and everything. I'll send you sneakers, shoes, families, people. I'm sure there's a hip-hop theme and song in the background. And that's not what it was meant for. It was meant as a mechanism of expression. The South Bronx turned from like two-thirds, you know, Jewish and Italian in 10 years to two-thirds Puerto Rican and black. And it's like in that process, you know, the us burning down like that was our medium to let out. But now was, oh, this is hot. We want to do this. I'm like... No, you need your own thing. <laughs> you need to yeah. express yourself. And then you see them try to, you know, their pattern of speech trying to mimic what we have in it. Like, it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily feeling that, man. I think people need to find their own voice and find their own medium, you know, mechanism when they have their own heart and history. And when they try to just consume without spitting out something that they have fabricated from their own mind, I, it feels artificial to me. That's something that I feel very yeah. awkward about. Well, I mean, I think everything now is, is uh, hybrid. Is that how you say it? Hybrid. 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 Okay. Herbrid. It's herbrid. Damn it. Right. It's herbrid. English is my second language. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. It's that. And so, in a way, that's because we're so interconnected that we absorb. I mean, you heard how much, like, now salsas and cumbias are, are going into, you know, mainstream, and even how music from, like, India and stuff, so I, I do feel like there's a lot of borrowing Bollywood and, and all that. But I also know that, I mean, if Ameri um, um, the, uh, how much we push out for people to consume, like, American culture is crazy. I mean, it's not just in hip-hop, it's in every aspect of living, even, like, what we eat, you know, how much we work. All those things, this whole thing of wanting to buy, 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 be in debt, we're exporting that to other people in the world. You know, that kind of way of life. So Fear into consumption. Yeah, so. and it's interesting because, you know, I went to Japan and I remember seeing a lowrider magazine. Um, Low <laughs> what are these people doing with this magazine? <laughs> Wait, this is the I'm crazy not saying part. Anything. This is the crazy part. Is that I was flipping through it and it was not photos of like the brown dudes in L.A., it was like all Japanese people. In the Lowrider magazine, is yeah, a Japanese and they version? Were, they have their Lowrider festivals, and they had this spread. They keep it real. Where they were like all dressed as Bloods and Crips, and they even had gats. And I was like, yo, this is crazy. This that's is the problem. Something gets lost in the translation. Yeah, I agree. Literally, <laughs> metaphorically, it's just like, I, was like, what? I don't like this that. Is crazy. I don't this like is, that. Not just that. I mean, this is like some real war happening in our communities. You can't just. You don't just imitate it like that. And I also would see, you know, J Japanese men who would um, kind of curl their hair so that they could have this whole like fro kind of looking thing. And I was like, yo, you. I've seen this on is, TV. I've, I didn't know. If it was I real. was like, that's so that's you you, you, you verified as a first hand person. No, I verified because I saw this on I, TV, I think, man. I was a little concerned. I, I think I think we we have to address that head on because when I see that I in Japan, I I also you know talked about it. I said, hey, you know, like you can't. You can't just like consume what it means like to be a person of color. You ha you know there's certain boundaries you kind of have to keep. You know so. I mean it's not even that. It's not if it's not true. You know if it's not yeah. true and something is coming out of it's not. Why would you do that? It, is, it right. says nothing about like if you want to express yourself. It says nothing about you or your people or your history. If you just start mimicking someone else like that, like it just I mean it can either be an, an honor to represent them, but it's like after a while the mimicry just becomes pointless. I think. Yeah, and then also I don't think it. It, it means that we have this historical amnesia of what that stuff, where that stuff's coming from. All right, the Bronx was burning when all of this music was created. They were in uh, one year, maybe in 74, and it's documented in Mel Rosenthal's book and a lot of other stats. I think there were like 33 fires per night in the Bronx. Landlords were literally, through various mechanisms, paying people to burn buildings down. Right? They would pay kids anywhere from 5 to $15 sometimes, in some instances, just to burn down a building. Okay, And the people, you know, they were reporting one time the World Series was being held in the Bronx. And they are saying, oh my God, the Bronx is burning. Like People were commenting, why would the people of the Bronx burn down these buildings? And it wasn't the case. It wasn't the people. It was the owners of the properties because they were federally support supported and required to have insurance. And the government was giving them money. And from all that angst and social unrest and trouble, you know, and then drugs flooding in and all this stuff. People started utilizing this as a mechanism to voice their opinion, you know, social commentary in essence, to a beat, or talking trash at the party, etc. And so people try to, you know, do all this over again. It's like, 
I'm not. I don't see your buildings burning down. You know, fabricate that, reproduce that, and maybe I can feel the emotion behind it. Otherwise, it just seems strange. You know, like and maybe you, you kind of captured that with the Lowrider magazine. Like, yeah. it is no way connected to their culture. Right, and I think that what has to happen is because I think that young people expressing themselves in any way is, is very powerful, especially when what's happening now. And so, in a way, right right now, people all over the world are being like, "Yo, this is." This is messed up. Like you can't disengage from politics anymore because it's affecting everyone. Even if you are just listening to the music. Even if you are, I mean, even even like a a young person now has to consider how much debt they're gonna be into because of all these bailouts. You got actually, I don't know how old you are, but my I would say <laughs> high school students. <laughs> I, students who I'm, are. I just turned I just turned 18. <laughs> okay, well, high, people who are in high school. People who are in high school today are going to be the most indebted, ah, yes, <laughs> indebted generation. They're going to carry the biggest loads Thus far, in terms yeah. of what it is that we're doing. Yeah. And, and better also, work hard. There's not going to be financial for a couple aid. Fin- look at the fun- what's happening with financial aid is Even so whack. School, yeah. it, just, it gets me mad that, that there was money to fund this war and now people can't even... Financial aid is cut. They're cutting enrollments to public institutions, you know? It's just like we, we are paying... And other people got their pockets filled. I mean, Enron had their most profitable year at, this year? at the cost. Enron or Exxon? Exxon. I think it was, I don't Exxon know. Mo- Enron. Exxon, oh, Exxon oh, sorry. Exxon, Exxon, guys. Enron, Exxon Enron doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, I was Exxon like, they went under a while right. ago. They did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they had their taxing and accounting uh, yeah, problems. Yeah, and so when you, see, when, you, when you see stuff like that, you're like, wow. Like, there's, there's they're making big money off off um, the backs of all of us. Yeah, and good folks out there, another website you can visit is dandeman.com. Coming up, dandeman.com. We've got the special guests in the background. One thing I wanted to say about New York and the Bronx and music is like, like I said, these people reproducing this, it's just, it, I, I don't understand what's going through their mind. Like, can you, when you, when you encountered this, yeah. What was your reaction to like seeing someone like have you, I'm sure when you were there you saw some hip hop artist. Yeah. Were they in, potentially even English trying to spit in English? Like what was your, you know, your visceral reaction to seeing all well, this? Well, I mean, I, I have, I have, I have, I have, I have kind of mixed feelings about it. Cause I, on the one say, hand, I knew she was gonna say that. <laughs> I had mixed feelings. On the one hand, like I'll tell you, the Japanese salsa bands uh-huh. are some of like the hottest salsa bands oh, really? in, in, in the world. I mean, they they are so meticulous around. I'm sure they're technically music. on point. I'm sure they're technically oh, on technic- point. Yeah, technically. Technically sound. Yeah. And, uh, and, and and to me, it's like, wow. That's, that's not a down comment. Why are you laughing at that? But also the, fact. The, fact, the fact that people would study something so much to try to get it as accurate as possible. Yeah. That's almost... Authentic. Authentic, authentic as possible. This, 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 this <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're looking for? <laughs> right. So, but at the, at, at the same time, though, I hear you. Because I'm like, I would sometimes see people... Like dressed in ways that I was like, if you would walk like that in Oakland, you would get shot, you would get killed. <laughs> no, but you would because you're like all gangstered out. That's not the, the murder rate in Oakland is five times the national average for folks out there, along with robbery. Don't for folks don't. It's not right. a joke out there. No parts of parts of parts of Oakland are very affluent, but yeah. right in so the hills yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, the same thing happened to me. I went to a place. I was in Vienna. It was during there during the Euromeister kickoff, which is like. World Cup is every four years. Euromeister is two years in between, so every four years as well. And I went there. The kickoff was in Vienna. I'm there opening weekend. And I go to this one spot. It's the hip-hop club. And a couple of hip-hop songs come on. They're using all sort of, you know, vulgar, derogatory language. And they're repeating it verbatim with the song. These people either speak Austrian or German. I'm like, I'm like, okay, okay. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? I'm looking at these people like, I didn't get it. I just... (laughs) Honestly, I'm not not to distract anybody. Well, I don't give a really but I just didn't get it. Why are you repeating the words and saying, trying to sing it with the same emotion that they see in the videos and repeating them like, and that's what I'm saying. Hip hop took over the world, man. People Wait, can say whatever they you want. You don't have to go to Europe to see that. I mean, you can just go to like a little house party in the hood, and people are like repeating all like those crazy lyrics without. But thinking some of the, about but it is it. different when the cops are circulating your block every day, every hour. Well, I, I don't know. You I live in some areas. The cops are like this. 
there's these constant societal pressures to make people like they can only see themselves in the three minute video they can't see themselves in the two hour long feature length film where they're successful and happy they only see themselves in a three minute video trying to reproduce that but a lot of that image is built by white men in power I mean the ones who are rucking, running the record companies and who are saying hey dude wear those chains show those gats lean on the car like that that's all being fabricated by men in power who are saying we want you to have this image of the black man and and so I don't necessarily think it's authentic I don't think that you know they're making those songs while they're like you know getting assaulted by the cops I think a lot of them are making a lot of money and there many of the lyrics are very you know degrading to women but there's that's because there's a huge profit to be made see but I wouldn't say that they're fabricating I say they're they were the you know the, the not they were the impetus and the helping to propagate it, but the, it was fabricated into our culture by other societal pressures. Like I said, in the Bronx, after this sort of social collapse with the burnings building down, you know, economic turmoil, they were playing shrinkage. Robert Moses, you can folks and read about him in the Bronx. In essence, you know, they were limiting mental health facilities. They're limiting all these, you know, fire departments. Services were being decreased. Police services were being decreased. People's quality of life was constantly decreasing to the point where it was very, very easy with the economy crumbling to just have another, you know, underground economy of drugs, you know, coming in infest. And when that came into reality and, you know, came onto the scene and they saw how profitable it could be, how popular they could make yeah. it because of this medium of hip hop, they helped reproduce it. You know, and propagated by offering money. That's why we have Soldier Boy. That's why we have songs that all these people can, you know, certain songs by 50 cents and whatnot. These people want to hear and over and over again because they saw that image and they saw how quickly it would be consumed. Like, okay, well, let's keep paying people to do this, right? Because it pads our pockets. Not necessarily because it helps society or because, but I mean, like I said, it wasn't the only image, but I think part of it was, unfortunately, us succumbing to these pressures. But then how much of that is. Us, you know, young people who consistently see that, how much of that is real and how much of it is just mimicking what um, mainstream TV is telling you to act like. But there, I'm, what I'm saying is that's the came onto the scene in the Bronx without TV even being around. Right. Well, I mean, hip hop was born. I, I, I think hip hop, what it was. People were dressing with gold born. chains. They were doing some stuff that was not appropriate because everything was going to hell. You walked around a building, right. you look at pictures of the South Bronx, there were nothing but brick yards. Buildings were literally burning every single day of the year. That okay? was 40 years ago, though. No, during the 70s and even into the 80s as well. Yeah. They would have festivals in the Bronx. The Newport companies and the beer companies would have festivals where they would just give out free cigarettes. Boxes upon boxes of cigarettes to, without even checking ID. It's like... People were gonna start smoking cigarettes. Like you know, they were take they were taking advantage of young people and like putting all these thoughts into their mind. Yes. Yeah. But like I said, there was this wasn't our only image, but we you know we we allow this image of ourselves to be created, and then yeah. it got propagated by them. And now I feel like we have to make a, a new kind of image because now we what they're circulating out there about us is so inaccurate. You know, and it's so disempowering, actually. I mean, even think about how many empowered Latinas you see on TV that are not maids or are not, like, somebody's, you Object. know... Like, ah, exactly. It's and, and this is... We're in 2009. How many disabled people do you see on TV? Or even Asian women, Southeast Asian women, Middle Eastern Arab women. We're invisible, you know? You know what's crazy? I saw that Jamie Foxx show not too long ago, and I saw the, the one Asian woman that was on there from the... Uh, who is she? The one Asian woman from what the hell is this thing called? She was the maid or, or some sort of cleaner within the within the hotel. She ends up having this silly, you know, ignorant accent. Have you seen the Jamie Foxx show? No, I haven't. Oh man, this one woman. She's like the typical, you know, not you know stereotypical Asian person with a horrible lane, you know, buck teeth. Not necessarily a little bit of buck teeth, and then like just speaking. Very, 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 no, it's, it's the channel. Let me turn myself down so I don't give any feedback. It's WRF up here, Banner One Zero Four Point Five FM. WRF up here, Banner One Zero Four Point Five FM. I want to take a quick commercial break, play a little music, and then come back. Is that cool? We'll come back and do it. We also have another guest who may want to pop into the picture. We might have pop in another camera as well. <laughs> it's WRF up here, Banner One Zero Four Point Five FM. If you're catching us live on the internet, audio, visual, we appreciate you supporting us. Like I said, Benny showing us some of our grandmother, my mother, my godmother back in New York and Puerto Rico, and now in Florida as well. If you're in Miami, all the people listening to us in Massachusetts, New York, you know. California, you know, Los Angeles, big up to DJ Nella Slum who's in the background, big up to everyone who's in the area, dandeman.com. Thank you to iResist.org for helping to facilitate all of this. A shout out to the Bay Area. To the Bay Area. A shout out to um, Germany, if, if my friends <laughs> in Germany are listening, uh, and Italy, and of course, big shout Berlin out to Berlin is the sh. Oakland. 
I love Berlin, man. I went to Berlin. I, I really felt like I was in New York, man. I was like, oh my god. I but, know, I felt like I was in New York too. But it's cool, man. We're gonna take a quick musical interlude. A lot of folks use the bathroom. Keep staying to with us. It's your show.